Good morning again. In 1961, the Green Bay Packers, anybody know who the Green Bay Packers are? Football team? Oh, somebody actually likes them over here? Okay. Aaron Rodgers fan, you know, all that stuff. In 1961, the Green Bay Packers had lost. (laughs) They weren't that good. Um, They had gone to the finals, they'd gone to the championships in 1960, but they lost. And in 1961, the players gathered together with the training staff and the coaches, and they all came together for training camp. That happens before the season. And they get together, and they work on new plays, and they practice, and they try out new things to improve on the season before. They want to get better. In 1961, the coach of the Green Bay Packers was Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi got up in front of all of these professional football players who played for money, this was their job, was to play football. He got up in front of them all, and at the beginning of training camp, at the beginning of training season, he got up with a football and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. Everybody there knew that that was a football. They knew what the game was, they knew how it was played, they knew what the rules were. But Coach Lombardi took nothing for granted. He didn't assume anything, and he went back to the very beginning of the basics, of the fundamentals of how do you play football. Number one, this is a football. And because Coach Lombardi went back and focused on the fundamentals, he went back to the basics, the Green Bay Packers went on to win five championships. They went on, Vince Lombardi never had a losing season after that. He never lost in the playoffs. He was a very successful coach, and many attribute his success in football, in sports, to the fact that he focused on the fundamentals so much, even with the professionals who knew what they were doing. That's what led to their success. When it comes to the church, how do we succeed? How do we measure growth? How do we determine what takes us to the next level in terms of, we're not playing football, but but how, how do we get better? How do we improve? How do we become more faithful? How do we become better at the things that Christ has called us to do? Well, we should do the exact same thing that Coach Lombardi did. We don't look to new innovations. We don't look to new things. We go back to the basics. We go back to the fundamentals. And we don't want to assume anything when it comes to who we are and what we do. We want to go back to the basics. So over the next few weeks, we're going to have, uh, kind of dive into this. This is the church, not this is a football. We're not going to talk about football anymore. We're going to talk about what is the church? This is the church. How does the Bible present the church? Who are we? What do we do? Who leads us? Who calls us? What direction do we go? What plays do we make, to use the football analogy? What is the purpose of all this? We're gonna go back to the Bible and we're gonna ask some fundamental questions. But before we do that, let me pray. Father, we come to you now as a needy people. We recognize that that we can do nothing on our own. That the strength to move forward, the grace, the mercy that we need is vast and endless. We thank you that you are a God of endless mercy, abounding in steadfast love, and we ask today that you would express your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you've preserved it for us, that you've given it to us, that it is mighty and powerful, that that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it can pierce to the very division of soul and spirit. We thank you, we praise you, Father, today that your word is still alive and active, that it still moves that it still reveals, that it still calls sinners to be saved, to find grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And we ask that today would be a great day of salvation. We pray for the children downstairs. We ask that you would give their teachers words of wisdom. May they be filled with the words of life that come from your word, and may you move in a powerful way in the hearts of the children. We thank you for them. We thank you for the time that we have. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So what is the church? If we're gonna figure out what the point of all this is, if we're gonna figure out what steps we ought to take as a people, as a congregation, we need to answer the very fundamental question of what is the church? What do we mean when we talk about church? 
We throw that term around a lot, the church. But what do we mean? Are we talking about the building? The church is the four walls that we have here and the steeple, and if you don't have a steeple, you're not a very good church, you're not a very faithful church. You you have to have this in place in order to be the church. Are we talking about a particular denomination? Are we talking about the, the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the Roman Catholic church or the Eastern Orthodox church? Is that what we talk about when we talk about the church? Do we, do we, do we talk about the church in, in a sense of, we're not quite sure exactly what we mean, but we mean something. It's this concept or idea that we have in our minds, but we're just not sure how to articulate it. What do we mean by the church? We want the biblical definition. We want what the Bible has to say. We want what God has to say about who we are. If we consider the word itself, church, and we dive into our Bibles, and we just look at every time we see the word church in our Bible, we see that the underlying Greek word there is ecclesia. Ecclesia, there's your $10 word for for the day, okay? You can take that home, and you can wow people over lunch. Although, I guess if you're eating with people from here, they'll already have heard this, so it's not that big of a deal. Ecclesia simply means gathering, assembly. So when we read of the church, we read of the gathering. The, to the church in Ephesus, to the church in Rome, to the church that gathers in this person's house or that person's house, the authors of scripture are talking about the gathering, the assembly, the ecclesia that is meeting in that home. To the gathering at Rome, to the assembly in Ephesus. It simply means to gather, to assemble, to come together, to congregate. That's where we get the word congregation from. We are the congregation of Richmond Hill Baptist Church. We have congregated with one another. The question is a gathering of who? Who is assembling? Who is coming together? If we read the New Testament, we will see other words in our English translation that have the word assembly actually in there. It's the same underlying Greek word, we've just translated it differently. There is the ecclesia in Acts chapter 19. The ecclesia that comes together, there's a big riot going on in Ephesus. They're upset because as the gospel is being preached, people are no longer buying the idols. People are no longer worshiping at the temples and buying sacrificial animals to to burn on the altar of, of the pagan gods. And they're losing money. There's a big riot, a big uproar because Christianity is spreading. And so this ecclesia, this gathering, this church comes together in this riot form and we're told in Acts 19 verse 32, they're confused. People just keep showing up and they're not really sure what's going on, but somebody started it and now they're here and they're called an ecclesia. There's civic gatherings, civic assemblies like this. There's other religious assemblies, ecclesias, but that's not what we mean when we say the word church, is it? We're not talking about the the church that meets at the mayor's office for some civic ceremony. The New Testament also describes not just general gatherings, general ecclesias, it, gather, it, it describes a gathering of, of specific people, which is why we translate that term when it's talking about a specific people as the church. It's talking about those who, who have gathered in Jesus' name. Those who, who gather but are marked by something very distinct. Marked by those for whom, marked as those for whom Christ died. You'll remember in Ephesians 5, Paul will tell husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, the ecclesia, the gathering, and gave himself up for her. He sacrificed himself, he gave himself, he died on the cross to redeem his people for their sins, and the gathering, the church, is those people. It's not just everybody who comes together inside these four walls, the church are those for whom Christ died. The church is not a perfect people. The church is not even necessarily good people sometimes. The church is the redeemed people. The church is the sanctified people, the saved people, the people who were once lost but now are found, the people who were once blind but now see spiritually because of the work that Christ did. Christ came to save sinners. He died on the cross while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinful, 
There was nothing we could do to make ourselves look good towards God, to put ourselves in his favor, and so Christ came and died. And the people that he died for gather together, they come together, and they are his church. The biblical definition, word definition, is that the church is the gathered people of God, the gathered, sanctified, redeemed people of God. That's who we are. That's who we are as the church of Jesus Christ. But what's our purpose? What's the point of all this? We've been saved, we've been redeemed, and now we come together. We gather together in Jesus' name. What do we do? What's the point of all this? Why do we gather? What I'd like to do is show you three biblical illustrations, three descriptions that the the scriptures give to us that describe who we are, and from that description of who we are, we get the implication of what do we do? What's the point? Why are we here? So turn with me to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. The first one we're going to see is that the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are many things we could turn to in terms of how does the Bible describe who we are? We are the family of God. We are soldiers of Jesus Christ, therefore the church is the army. There are many that we could turn to. I'm just gonna look at three, and the first one that we're going to consider this morning is that the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What was the temple for? Let me ask you that question. I know we don't usually do a call and response here. What was the temple for? What was its purpose? Somebody said something. Everybody's nervous. Worship. Worship. We probably say that is the primary purpose of the temple. It's where people would come and the priests would, would basically live there. They would offer sacrifices and incense. They'd bake bread. They'd have altars. They'd have all sorts of stuff going on in the temple. And the purpose of the temple was worship, the worship of God. It's where people would go to worship because that's where God was. That's where they could meet with God. The temple was where God dwelt. It's where his presence was. You would worship there because that's where God rested, dwelt, lived with his people. When the temple was built, David wanted to build the temple. He said, "How this doesn't seem fitting that I have a house of my own and God lives in a tent in the tabernacle. I should build a house for God. God said, no, it's not gonna be you, it's gonna be your son, Solomon. And so Solomon is thoroughly equipped by his father David and Solomon builds the temple. And when they had finished building the temple, Solomon prayed a prayer of dedication to, for the temple. And this is what happens after he prays. Can you read that? Oh, that's really small. Sorry about that. Second uh, Corinthians seven, you can listen. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. After Solomon prays this prayer of dedication, the Lord descends in fire and consumes the the offering and the sacrifices. Fire, you will remember, is the way God's presence was represented in the Old Testament. You will remember God's presence was represented by fire in a burning bush to Moses. You will remember that after the Israelites leave Egypt, God presents himself as a pillar of cloud and day and a pillar of what at night? Fire at night. God's presence is represented by fire. And here, God's presence, represented by fire, descends on the temple. He dwells in the temple. And what do the people do? God is good, his steadfast love endures forever. What are they praising God for? This is actually a very practical thing for you and I to to work through. They praise God. God is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Why? Because God dwells with his people. How often do we have to say and think in our minds that God is good because my, my fridge is full, because I have a job, because I have my health? God is good, and that is true. God is good, and God gives us many good gifts that we should give thanks for, but what what are the people thanking and praising God for? 
His presence. His presence, His dwelling with them. That's what marks God as good. How often do we think God is not good because we do not have? We do not have what we think we need or deserve. And we fail to remember that God is still good because God is with us. The temple was where God was, where God dwelt. It's where people could go to meet with God, to praise God, to worship, to offer sacrifices. The temple was where God was until it wasn't. Until there was a time where God no longer dwelt in the temple. In Ezekiel chapter 10, the Lord leaves the temple. Ezekiel sees this crazy vision and he sees lots of things. He sees cherubim, angels, with crazy looking faces. He sees wheels that are floating and moving all around. He sees fire. He hears the angel wings beating so furiously that it sounds like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And what he sees in Ezekiel chapter 10, in the midst of all of those crazy things, he sees the presence of God, the glory of God that once came and dwelt in the temple in 2 Chronicles. We see his presence leaving, departing. He's leaving because of sin, because of the sin of the people, because they've failed, because they've turned to the worship of idols. They failed to listen to God. God said, move in to the the land and drive all the people out. Don't dwell with them. Don't let them dwell with you because they are pagan, idolatrous people. And if you let them stay, they will pull your hearts away. They will allow you to drift away from the worship of me, the one true God. There are many other social and religious sins that the people had committed. But the primary one that the Lord lists is spiritual adultery. Failure to worship and honor him as Lord. They had abandoned God, so God was abandoning them. He's sending them into exile. Babylon's gonna come in and he's gonna wipe out everything. Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, they will destroy the city, they will destroy the nation, and they will destroy the temple. They've abandoned God, so God is abandoning them. Now at the end of Ezekiel, in chapter 43, God says that he will eventually bring the people back. That there will be a period, a time of exile, a time of being cast out of the land. Literally, the land has thrown you up. You know when you get indigestion and you throw up? That's the description that's given of the people. You are so disgusting sinfully that the land is spewing you forth. But after that time, after a period, you will be brought back. And God promises to one day dwell with his people again, to live with them in their midst. The problem is, that's a great promise, a wonderful promise of Ezekiel chapter 43. And yet, as we read through the rest of the Old Testament, as we look throughout the history found in the scriptures, the big glaring problem that we see is that even though the people come back, even though the temple is rebuilt, even though the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt, we never see God come back. The scriptures never describe the glory of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord descending upon the temple and dwelling with his people again. They're back. They've been restored. And yet God's not there. God doesn't return to the temple, any of them. He doesn't return to the rebuilt temple. He doesn't return to Solomon's temple. We never have a description of God coming back. When is the next time in the Bible post-prophets, that we see the Spirit of God descending. We see, him, we see it at Jesus' baptism. We see it when Christ is baptized by John. Matthew 3, verse 16, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. This is where we see God's promise of Ezekiel 43 being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is now the true and better temple. That glorious temple that was built under Solomon, as beautiful as it was, it's gone. That rebuilt temple when they come back, it's not good enough. Herod will build another temple, a bigger and better one 
to try to impress, to try to sway the Israelites, the Jewish people, to actually like him, to be on his side. The Lord doesn't descend on that one. Where does he descend? Where does he take up residence? Where does he live? He lives in the person of the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true and better temple. He's the definitive and the only way to actually come and meet with God. If you want to meet God, you must come through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. You want to meet with God? You got to come through Jesus. You want to worship God? You got to come through Jesus. All of those other religions that say, God is up there at the mountaintop, and it doesn't matter which way you come up the mountain, as long as you get to the top and can worship God at the top, it doesn't matter how you get up there. Jesus says, no, there is only one way. There is only one path. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the road that leads to God, that leads to the kingdom, that leads to righteousness, salvation, redemption. Broad is the way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Jesus is the only way. And so when Jesus dwells in Israel, it can be legitimately said that God is dwelling in his temple again, in Jesus Christ. But then Jesus leaves. There's Easter. We just celebrated Easter, Resurrection Sunday last week. Jesus dies on Good Friday. He rises on Sunday. And then he's with his people for a number of days. And then he ascends into glory. He leaves physically and goes. So is God's presence left? Is God no longer with us? Has has the ascension of Jesus separated us once again from the presence, the pure worship of God? No, because he promises to send his spirit. He says in John 16, I will send a helper. He promises again at the beginning of Acts chapter one, I will send my spirit. And when does the spirit come? We should finally turn to the passage that I told you to turn to. Look in Acts chapter two. The spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. The very sounds that Ezekiel heard when the presence of God left. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, the things that Ezekiel saw as the Spirit of God left the temple are the things that the people see as God now comes back and dwells with his people. What's happening here in Acts chapter two? Well, one, Jesus is fulfilling his promise. But two, the promise that was made back in Ezekiel 43 is being fulfilled again in a different way, in a new way. God's presence is back with his people. God's presence dwelling first in the person of Jesus Christ, the true and better temple, but he's also dwelling in us, in the church, in the disciples of Jesus Christ, in all those who come to him in faith, he dwells in them as as his spiritual temple. This promise isn't just for the apostles. The promise wasn't given just to those first century disciples. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer. Listen to what Peter says in Acts chapter two. He's just preached to thousands of people in Jerusalem. And they are cut to the heart, the text says. They hear of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and like the word of God does, it cuts. And it cuts them to the heart, and they say, what must we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the gospel. And then the byproduct of believing and trusting in the gospel is, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every person who puts their faith, every person who repents, has the Spirit of God descend upon them and dwell in them. The whole church is the temple. Every Christian is the temple. And collectively together, we are the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says this very explicitly, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroy God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. He will also describe the church as the dwelling place of God in Ephesians chapter two. Peter calls the church the spiritual house of God. And when when they're talking about the yous, when we read you, for you are that temple, the yous here are plural. 
Paul isn't pointing at one particular individual and saying, just you, the pastor, are the temple, or you, the super spiritual Christian over here, are the temple. You, collectively, gathered together as the church, you are the temple of God. The church, the gathered body, is not the only place where God is present. Last fall, we looked at the attributes of God and we considered how God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God is spiritually everywhere you go. Which means if God is everywhere, there's a sense in which we can worship God anywhere. There's a sense where you can worship him at home in your closet. You can worship him as you climb to the mountaintop. You can worship him with your family. You can worship him wherever you go because God is with you wherever you go. And yet, The church is the place where God expects his people to worship. That's what the church was created to be. You as the temple of Jesus Christ gathered together, your purpose is worship. That's why you were formulated, that's why you were crafted, that's how you were designed. So what is the church? The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as his temple, we are designed for worship. We are designed for the worship of God. We are designed not to look inwards to ourselves, but upwards towards glory, and to give our praise, worship, and honor to him. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. The second illustration, the description that we get, and this one will be familiar to more of us, I think if we've been around the church any length of time, the church is the body of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. He's talking about how there's there's many different gifts of service that as you look at the church, as you look at the, the, the people of God, we don't all look the same, we don't all sound the same, we don't all smell the same, we have very different gifts. And Paul is explaining in 1 Corinthians 12 why we're different. He's explaining why every member has a gift, at least one. Some have more than one, but we don't all have the same gifts. We don't have all of the gifts. We don't have everything. And to describe and explain why that's the case, Paul uses the physical body as an illustration of the church. And In verse 27, he actually says it just very explicitly, and you are the body. You are the body of Jesus Christ. What what is he talking about? Well, let's just look at 1 Corinthians 12 and see why he would use this illustration. In verse 14, Paul says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. We only have one body, but our body has many different parts, has many different members. We're not all just one single thing. We have different beings to who we are, and so does the church. Members look and function differently, but they're still a part of the same body. Look in verse 15 and 16. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. What is he saying? He's saying that the the eye and the hand, which he's using here as maybe the more desirable parts of the body, he's saying the eye and the hand don't have more bodiness to them. Is that a word? Uh, We'll go with it. They don't have more bodiness to them than the ear or the foot. Just because there's an eye and an ear, they are both equally a part of the body. One is not higher up. There's not a better tier. There's There's no more greatness or no more bodiness to them because they're not just like the other one. In verse 17, all parts are important and crucial. If the whole body were an eye, there would, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? Where, if there's no nose, you don't smell. If there's no ear, you can't hear. If there's no eye, you can't see. The body needs different parts, different members, because things would be missing if they didn't exist. So don't be upset that you're not something else. Look in verse 18. But as it is, God arranges the members of the body, each one of them, as he chooses. God puts us together. God organizes. God orders. God designs. 
He arranges the members of the body as they are. It's his design. It's not my design. It's not our collective design. It's the design of God himself. And he organizes, he arranges, he distributes the gift as he sees fit. No body part is disposable or or unimportant. Look in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Everyone is significant. Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone is vitally important to the body. Even the seemingly weak ones are, are vitally important. Verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. That means that there's no member of the church that is unimportant, that isn't directly valuable to the life of the church, of the body. That means we shouldn't devalue others. We shouldn't look down our noses at other people. We shouldn't look at other people who maybe don't have the same gifts as we do. We shouldn't allow pride to creep up in our hearts and we shouldn't, we shouldn't push people off to the side and say, yeah, it's nice that you've got a servant's heart, but maybe go stack chairs instead. Which stacking chairs, by the way, is not, not a bad thing. We need people to stack chairs. We shouldn't devalue others, but we also shouldn't devalue ourselves. How many times in your life have you looked at other people in the church and gone, wow, I wish I just had a little bit of their gifting? I know I have. How many times have we looked at our church and said, you know what, because I'm not the pastor, because I'm not a deacon, because I don't serve on the music team, because I don't oversee a ministry, because I don't have any of those things, because I'm not in those positions, because I don't have those gifts, I'm really, what's, what's the point? Why am I even here? Why would I even bother to serve in any capacity? I can't serve like them, why would I serve at all? Paul says, don't devalue yourself. You're important, you're valuable. We're not designed to do the same things but we are designed for the same purpose. Look in verse 24, the middle of verse 24 there. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members, all of them, may have the same care for one another. Why does God make us different? Why does God give us different giftings and abilities? Why does the Spirit not make us all the same? It's for the good of the body, for the edification, for the building up, for the care, as Paul says, the care for one another, the care for the body. The nose, think of your nose. The nose smells spoiled food, doesn't it? And what does your nose keep you from doing? Eating something that's gonna make you sick. What what do the eyes do? The eyes look down the road as you're driving. They assess the danger ahead. They assess the road ahead and they keep you from swerving off the path. They keep you from going in a path that's gonna be dangerous. The ear hears the cry for help. The the ear keeps its ear to the ground, if I could say that. And it's listening, it's paying attention. It's calling the body to mobilization, to move. There are people out there that need us. Let's go, let's move. Some hands are, are tough. They're rough. They're almost like fists because they're fighting off the wolves. Other hands are more gentle, soft, caring, because they're bandaging the other wounded parts of the body. The feet are are bearing the full weight of the body. You think of being on your feet for a long day, and you get home and you kick off your shoes, you put your feet up, Man, my feet are sore. But what did your feet do that day? They served you well by carrying you where you needed to go, whether it was work or the grocery store. You probably didn't give much thanks to your feet, did you? But your feet didn't complain. They carried you, carrying you to safety, where you ought to go. And it's true with the church. The church has many different parts. The body has different parts for the good, for the edification of the whole body, physically. And it's same with the church. We are built with many different members, but one body. You can live without certain body parts, can't you? You can live without a hand, you can live without a leg, you can live without your appendix, apparently. 
We still haven't figured out what the appendix is for. So let me give you a spiritual application. Don't be a spiritual appendix. What I mean is, if you were removed, would people notice? The body can live without certain parts, but that's not how God designed our bodies to work and to function. It's the same with the church. The body functions properly as God intended, as God designed, when we're all present, when we're all active, when we're all giving, when we're all serving, when we're all working within the gifts, within the, within the boundaries that God designed us for. The body suffers, and maybe this is, this is a different perspective that we need sometimes is that we, we think, well, it's not that big a deal if I don't show up. It's not a big deal if I don't serve. But a hand that refuses to grip anything actually causes the body more damage. An eye that refuses to open causes damage to the body because then the, the body doesn't know where it's going. The parts of the body need to be present, and not just present, but working, active. Just as a sidebar, this afternoon, after our Sunday school, our the nominating committee is gonna be getting together. We go through the list of all of the members of our church, and we see where people are serving, where they're active, and also where they're not. And you will likely, if you're a member of Richmond Hill Baptist Church, you will get some sort of phone call, email, text from one of the members, and they will be asking, where have you been serving? Are you content to still serve there? Are you content to serve with your gifts there? Or if not, where else can we find a place for you? And if you're not serving anywhere, they will call you and they they will say, where should you be serving? How can you be serving? In what way can we plug you in into the life of the church? Why do they do that? Do they do that to make you feel guilty? Do they do that because they wanna have an awkward conversation about you saying no and them really trying to pressure you? No. We do this, we have a nominating committee because we believe that the church is the body of Jesus Christ and that every member has something valuable to give. Maybe you don't know what that is. You need some help figuring that out. Come talk to me. Talk to one of the deacons. Talk to another valued member of this church and we will find out how you can serve. What is the church? The church is the body of Jesus Christ. And as his body, we were designed for the edification, for the building up of one another. Lastly, turn to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one. The third and final illustration or description that we'll look at today is the church is the embassy of God's kingdom. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Jesus Christ the Son. And we are the embassy of God the Father's kingdom. Let me ask you this question, and, and you have to put up your hand, okay? This isn't one that you can't, you can't skip out on. How many of you were not born in Canada? You were born in another country? Well, that's a good chunk. I don't know how many that is. Two-thirds, maybe three-quarters of our church was not born in Canada. Do you know what that makes you? It makes you an alien. <laughs> not the little green aliens, not like Marvin the Martian or something like that but it makes you an alien to Canada. Canada was foreign to you, and you were foreign to Canada. Alien, stranger, it is not, not native, not a part of Canada. Now, you may have moved here any number of years ago, and you may have changed your citizenship, you may have changed your passport, but when you first got here, you were an alien to Canada, and Canada was alien to you. In 1 Peter chapter one, as Peter addresses the church, He calls the believers, he calls the disciples of Jesus Christ, the church there that he writes, he calls them the same thing. He calls them aliens, strangers. Some translations say elect exiles. You think of the exile that Israel went into. They were taken from their homeland, what was native to them, and they were taken to what was foreign, what was alien. They were taken into exile. And Peter says, that's you as the church. You are aliens, you are exiles, you are strangers. The question is to what? Strangers to this world. This world is not our home, it's not native to us anymore. We don't belong here. Our citizenship doesn't rest in any any nation in the world. 
It doesn't even rest in the world itself. Our citizenship rests in heaven. In Ephesians chapter two, Paul says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. That is strangers and aliens to God, to his kingdom, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There's another illustration we could look at, the household, the family of God. But what does he say? You are fellow citizens with the saints, with those who are of the kingdom. Our citizenship, our passport, doesn't have the world, it has heaven written on it. It has glory written on it. It has kingdom of God written on it. Does your life reflect that reality? Do you live as if your your, your home is somewhere else. Or do you live for the fruit of this world as if this world is all there is and this is the best that it's ever gonna get and that you've gotta get your slice of the pie here because this, this is where you live and die. We live as aliens for a reason. That's what Paul, that's what Peter say. You are aliens, you are strangers to this world, but there's a reason for it. Look in Acts chapter one, that passage I asked you to turn to, verse six. This is after Christ has, or um, as Christ is ascending into glory, post-resurrection. Jesus says, so when they had come together, that is the disciples, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We read of that a few moments ago. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What's he saying? He's saying that even in the spherical sense, in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, to the very ends of the earth, what is the purpose of the disciple of Jesus Christ? Why are they aliens to this world? Did Jesus forget about them? Did Jesus accidentally forget to take them to glory with him when he ascended? No, disciples are left with the task to be witnesses for Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul will call us ambassadors, representatives of the king, representing not ourselves, not our home, earthly nations, not even our families, not even our church right here, being representatives of Richmond Hill Baptist Church. We are representatives of Christ. The church has been called to be an outpost, an embassy of God's kingdom. What's the purpose of an embassy? Why are there embassies in Toronto from other nations? What's the point of those embassies? There, there are different, there are different um, buildings that have different titles, and I forget the second title of this other building. One represents us. That is, we can go to those places and we can get our passports renewed and we can get, if we're in a foreign country, we can, we can have all our documentation kind of come through that. Embassies are different. Embassies are designed and put in other countries to represent the home country in the host country. They are there, they are put there to represent the interests, the goals, the the business of whatever country they came from. Canada has 145 embassies worldwide. There are many more buildings that Canada has in other nations to get passports and all those other things, but 145 embassies representing Canada in other nations. They're representing the interests of Canada. They're not representing the interests of the host nation. They're not representing the interests of another nation, but the nation that they are ambassadors of. And the spiritual embassy that we are as the church, we represent the interests of the kingdom, of heaven, of our home nation. Ambassadors don't determine the laws. They don't determine the priorities. They don't determine what interests the nation. They just declare They just follow what their homeland documentation says. Here's our laws, here's our rules. Here they are, host nation. Here's who we are as a people. Here's what we believe, here's what we stand for, here's what we fight for. They don't determine those things, they just present them as documented. It's the same with the church. We don't come up with the priorities, we don't come up with the the things that interest us, we don't come up with the purposes and the plans. That's given to us in our documentation. 
It's given to us here. Our job isn't to come up with it. Our job is to present it, to preach it, and proclaim it. Our job is to represent and exemplify the culture of the kingdom. Have you ever visited somebody who, who's moved from another country, you've gone to visit in their home, and they've brought everything from their culture with them? They've brought their, their native food, they've brought their native clothing, they've brought their native music, they've brought their native decorations, they've brought all of that stuff, and when you enter that home, it's like stepping into a whole other world sometimes, isn't it? It's like stepping into a whole other nation. And you like, you turn around and you're like, I thought I was in Canada. What in the world is going on in here? This doesn't look the same at all. The church is designed by God to do that for people who were once living out here. They step into the church, into the gathered body, and they go, what in the world is this? This doesn't look like anything I've ever seen before. This doesn't look like what's around me out here. The church should look and sound like another nation, a whole other world. It should not look like the world. It should look entirely different because it is. We get into big trouble when we as the church start looking and sounding like the world. When we take on some of its practices, policies, procedures, theology, our ideas don't come up from within ourselves. Our purposes and our practices don't come from the world. They come from God himself, the king. We are representatives of the king. A faithful embassy is an accurate representation of the home nation. Be a really bad embassy if it didn't actually promote and talk about the interests of the home nation. And it's the same with the church. This is what we've been called to be. A faithful church is a a foretaste of heaven. People should step into the gathered body as it worships, as it cares for one another and builds one another up, and the world should go, this is different. I've never seen this before. What is the church? The church is the embassy of God's kingdom, and as his embassy, we are designed for representation, representation of the kingdom, of the king, to the host nation that we currently reside in, the world. So let me conclude with a wrap up here. What is the church? Well, the church is the temple, the body, the embassy. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God and our purpose is worship. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Our purpose is edification. We are the embassy of God's kingdom, and our purpose is representation. First, we worship God. That is our primary purpose. We gather to worship. Secondary, we come together for the edification, the building up of one another. And then thirdly, we are called to be together to represent, to preach and proclaim, to show to the world who God is, what the gospel is, what the Bible says, what the kingdom of heaven is like. May God help us. May God help us to be faithful to what he's called us to be, who he's built us to be, and may God, by his grace, help us to grow. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you that we are not the authors of our faith, that we are not called to determine who we are and what we should do. Lord, we thank you that you've not left us alone, that you've given us very careful instruction, that you've shown us in your word who we, should, who we are and what that means for us, how we ought to live. We ask that you would, you would help us by the power of your spirit dwelling within us to follow in faithfulness, to take steps in grace, Give us strength, give us courage to be who you've called us to be and may we be faithful witnesses, faithful representatives of your kingdom to the world. We thank you for our Savior and it's in his name that we pray, amen. I'm gonna invite the music team to come and I would invite the rest of you to please stand as we close our morning with a song.
Let's pray. We do long for the day, dear Father in heaven, for that day when we will stand with Christ in glory, with one another, saints of old, saints here, and saints yet to come into your kingdom. Give us a heart for heaven, Lord. Point our eyes off of ourselves, off of this world, onto the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, and may we live for the glory of the kingdom. In his name we pray, amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen.